Oh, slide me, yeah. Okay. How many are we? Okay. Now we are in YouTube. Okay. Hmm. Are we on? Matiin dulu saya punya suara, udah mati. Sudah berapa? Reslan Tisa Jenny. Okay. okay, I think we are on. Uh, let us start. I'm Reza Isaiji Jaini, the Executive Director of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. I will be your moderator for this afternoon. Excellencies, uh, distinguished resource person, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and, and friends. Uh, good afternoon a very, and a very warm welcome to you all uh, to the third part of the ASEAN IPR discussion series. Uh, convene in collaboration with our friends from the Center for Peace and uh, Conflict Studies. Today is the 11th of September, and uh, on this date, uh, 19 years ago, the world witnessed the devastating terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers of New York. The attack showed the escalation of capacity and ability of terrorist groups to cause damage and harm. And over the years, many more terrorist attacks happened around the globe. Indonesia and some of the ASEAN countries experienced that. But as we all know, governments, civil, institutions, civil society institutions, and people from all kinds of backgrounds and stakes come together and in preventing and countering terrorism with some good results. Over the years, we bear witness to the increased international cooperation, joint operations, sharing of information, uh, policies and regulations being put in place, and also the community participation uh, that uh, limit the movement and ability of terrorist groups to operate and strike attacks. In 2019, last year, ISIS was crushed in Iraq and Syria and lost last large territories that they once controlled for some years. Uh, this was indeed a significant and important development since ISIS has inspired the rise of many other groups or recruited people, including women, 
and youth as their fighters. Uh, but while, while ISIS is defeated and other terrorist groups are in check, last year we saw attacks being conducted by individuals and small groups claiming to be inspired by ISIS. We saw also in some countries, on the other hand, the rise of radicalization of certain groups of people and individuals that have caused harm to the uh, community. Uh, for example, uh, the attack uh, by one person on a mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand. Today, uh, unfortunately, we are seeing continued like, radicalization of young people, women, and even entire families. Many of these peoples ended up uh, joining terrorist networks and committing acts of violence. Uh, now, uh, the ASEAN Political Security Community Blueprint 2025 has tasked this institute, the ASEAN IPR, as one of the institutions to intensify involvement of all members of the community in activities relevant to the promotion of the culture of peace and moderation. Hence, uh, we've been tasked to address this matter with like-minded institutions and stakeholders to find ways on how uh, we could be part of and contribute to the efforts in countering violent extremism and terrorism and in maintaining peace and harmony in the region. Considering these uh, uh, circumstances, it is, I believe, fitting for our webinar today to take on the theme of uh, the contemporary challenges in countering radicalization and violent extremism. It is my hope that today uh, our discussion can provide us a deeper and more comprehensive understanding of where we are in preventing and countering violent extremism. And of course, uh, also to see uh, 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 what are the challenges, the new challenges, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic besetting our lives and disrupting our lives. And what can we do to uh, curve those challenges? To kick off the, our discussion this afternoon, I'm pleased to welcome our first distinguished Speaker, His Excellency Igor Drisman, the Ambassador of the European Union for ASEAN. Prior to his current uh, position, he was the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and the Vice uh, President of the European Commission until August last year. Uh, but before giving him the floor, I would uh, like to request all participants uh, or remind all participants to address their questions in the Q&A or the chat future available on your platform. Uh, YouTube participants may also address your questions through the live comment feature on the right hand side of the screen. We will try to address your question at the Q&A session following the presentation of our resource persons. Now, without further ado, I give the floor to our first speaker, Ambassador Drisman, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador uh, Resman, and thank you very much for, for organizing this uh, event uh, today. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, we're very happy with, with this uh, initiative, which you do together with the Center uh, for Peace and, and Conflict uh, Studies. So uh, uh, thank you very much. A very topical uh, um, uh, issue that we discussed today on, on, a, on the key date of, of 9 September, as you have, as you have pointed out. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be uh, not too not too long because we have uh, uh, people who are even more expert than I am in the topic uh, uh, also uh, today, and it will be important also to uh, uh, listen uh, to them uh, uh, today. Um, what I thought I'd do is to maybe uh, say a few words about the uh, European approach to uh, uh, counterterrorism. Uh, and uh, our external engagement, and then speak about our priorities for our, our joint work uh, with, with ASEAN and South, uh, Southeast Asia. 
Um, so in terms of in terms of the European uh, approach, um, uh, really counter terrorism, uh, countering radicalization and violent uh, extremism has has become a top priority uh, for us. Uh, you mentioned 9/11 uh, and some of the attacks that happened here uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we also had a series of uh, 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 terrorist attacks in Europe, especially 2015, 2016, uh, 2017, France, Belgium, uh, Germany. Uh, I myself am a, a Belgian uh, national and, and um, I myself was at, at only 50 meters of some of the uh, bombings that took place in the underground uh, in Brussels uh, in March 2016. So it's, it's an issue that... Uh, we we know, uh, and uh, it's an issue that has, for all these reasons, become um, a priority uh, for us. Um, if you if you look at the figures after uh, 20, 2017, there has uh, been a, a drop uh, in in the number uh, of attacks, but still, uh, I just looked them up. In two thousand eighteen, we had one hundred and twenty nine. Uh, failed, foiled, or uh, uh, completed terrorist attacks in one of the EU member states, uh, and uh, over a thousand people were uh, arrested for for terrorist offences. So, uh, overall, uh, the level of threat from terrorism has not uh, diminished in 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 Europe, uh, despite maybe some of the military successes we had um, on ISIS in in 2019. If anything, the situation has become uh, more more complex with uh, within the jihadist uh, milieu multiple actors with maybe divergent uh, motivation uh, and allegiance plotting alone or conspiring with with others and on the other hand you have a, a extreme right right wing uh, extremist who who try to uh, 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 use use the jihadist attacks and propaganda as fuel for their own uh, uh, terrorist uh, uh, agenda. Now, in terms of, of EU uh, policy, the, the framework we set in 2005, when the EU adopted a strategy uh, on, on counterterrorism, which was which was based on on four pillars. Uh, the first one is uh, prevention, uh, addressing the, the causes of radicalization and, and terrorist uh, uh, recruitment. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, an evolving policy, you have to take into account uh, new trends uh, all the time, uh, lone actor terrorism, foreign fighters, and the use of, of social, social media. And this prevention is something that we also stress uh, very often in our engagement with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with third countries. We'll, we'll come back to that maybe later. Um, second pillar is uh, protect, uh, uh, protecting citizens and, and infrastructure and reducing the vulnerability to uh, attacks. Uh, this includes securing external borders, improving transport security, uh, protecting uh, strategic uh, uh, targets and critical uh, infrastructure. In this area, uh, you might be aware of uh, uh, one directive regarding the, the use of passenger name records uh, 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 which uh, the EU has uh, uh, adopted. Again, we can say more about that later. Uh, the third pillar is, is one uh, uh, pursue, um, uh, basically where we're working to hinder terrorist uh, capacity to plan and organize and to bring uh, terrorists uh, to justice. It's more of a national competence, uh, but as, as an EU level, we try to improve cooperation and information uh, exchange between also police and uh, judicial authorities and amongst EU member states, uh, and of obviously uh, tackling terrorist uh, uh, financing. Again, we might come back on that. Um, and the fourth pillar is, is to respond. Uh, uh, that means preparing, managing, and minimizing the consequences of a terrorist uh, attack, uh, notably by improving uh, 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 capabilities uh, to deal with that and the coordination of the response and the and the victims' needs, uh, which had in the past maybe all too often been forgotten. So, basically, four pillars that together make um, a multifaceted uh, and, as we would call it, the whole of society um, uh, effort with different uh, uh, state institutions that have to support that, but also 
uh, a civilian-led uh, approach to CBE uh, through en engagement with communities at, at local and local level. Now, um, part of that strategy is um, uh, to very much keep with the United Nations uh, principles. Uh, reference here is the UN plan of action to prevent violent uh, extremism, which uh, recalls us that the definitions of terrorism uh, and uh, violent extremism are the pr prerogative of member states, but that they also must be consistent with their obligation under under international law, and maybe uh, Pa will say a bit more about about the United Nations. So, obviously, within that strategy, an important component uh, of our engagement is the external dimension. It's become increasingly uh, important through our policies, uh, but also through our uh, financial commitment um, in terms of assistance program uh, in uh, uh, PCBE, uh, we saw an increase of uh, funds committed of 60% uh, over the last uh, uh, two years with now over 30 million euro uh, committed in over uh, 20, uh, 20 countries. Um, ASEAN and Southeast Asia um, are one of our important or even mo most important uh, partners. We, we very much recognize that Southeast Asia has a history of violent extremism, which is often based on, on uh, uh, localized interaction, um, a very specific local situation, socioeconomic uh, context and political uh, context. Um, but we also saw the growth of, of transnational terrorism. Think about the... Uh, uh, the Bali bombings or or the Marawi uh, uh, siege, which ended in in 2017, and and those that kind of transnational terrorism brought brought new uh, strategies, methods, but also of course risks uh, uh, for uh, for for the region. Now, um, in terms of our engagement with 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 ASEAN, let me stress that this is not not new. Uh, already in 2003, we adopted a joint uh, declaration to combat uh, terrorism, uh, EU and ASEAN. That was basically in the, in the aftermath of the of the Bali Bali bombings. Uh, but we have uh, stepped up sub substantially over the last uh, couple of years. Um, we have um, uh, appointed a uh, EU counterterrorism security expert for Southeast Asia, who's based. Uh, here in Jakarta, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm very, uh, very pleased uh, about that. Uh, we all, but we also developed a number of, of projects. Let me just give you uh, one example. It's the, our project called Protect, uh, which uh, takes the framework of the UNDP's global program and, ad and adapts it to the regional context here uh, in Southeast Asia. Now, um, uh, as I said, we have a, a strong uh, commitment, we have a certain expertise uh, and, and a willingness to engage more uh, with ASEAN and we want to double down uh, on that partnership uh, in the future. Uh, and maybe I could uh, say just briefly the three areas, the three priorities we see uh, we see for, uh, 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 for the future. Uh, one is uh, countering uh, terrorism financing and any anti-money laundering. Uh, we know that uh, money is the key in, in many criminal uh, activities. Uh, uh, I suppose that's even more true for, uh, for terrorism. Uh, if you think that uh, the estimated amount of money laundered globally is, is between 2 and 5% of, of global GDP. Um, on the EU side, we have, uh, we have adopted um, a certain uh, regulatory uh, framework since uh, 2000. 18, um, but we need to continuously adapt at those rules uh, to tackle the new risk, to, track, to tackle new new trends. Think about technological uh, innovation, uh, think about the integration of financial flows in the internal market, the global nature of terrorist uh, organizations, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, also, we need to strengthen the checks on third countries, uh, which is what we're what we're doing. There is one um, kind of high profile exercise uh, that uh, uh, we have launched, uh, which is the identification of high risk uh, third countries that have deficiencies in their uh, anti-money laundering and countering terrorist financing uh, regimes. 
uh, but there is much more uh, uh, to that, uh, including an agenda, of course, of cooperation. Uh, and we, tr we will try to pursue here in Southeast Asia uh, an integrated approach on, 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 on these issues. And uh, maybe just one aspect that I'd like to mention in particular, uh, uh, given that you, you yourself are also a civil society organization, is the need for more analysis, more research uh, on this. Uh, uh, really, you need to, to map these things, uh, which are uh, sometimes, say, underboard, but, but often also uh, uh, above, uh, above uh, board. So work with research institutions and civil society uh, is, is definitely an important uh, aspect uh, of that. Uh, second priority is de-radicalization and engagement of uh, terrorist inmates and, and families. Uh, again, we sometimes face similar situations and, and challenges in, in Europe. Uh, we see often that prisoners uh, enter prison with uh, little or no, no um, uh, religious calling. And we see uh, during the time of their incarceration, some adopt certain uh, faiths and radicalize. Um, uh, and by the time inmates uh, return to to society, sometimes they, they become a threat even though they weren't before. So um, uh, an important, sometimes also sensitive conversation uh, that, we, that we need to have and um, uh, uh, programs that we would uh, in the future possibly uh, uh, adopt that, that are tailored to that particular uh, priority. Uh, the third uh, uh, priority I would just mention is the empowerment of women. Uh, children and families encountering radical and, and violent uh, extremist uh, narratives. Um, now, I think we, we saw over the last couple of years, women take up an increasingly active role in, in terrorist uh, activities, terrorist groups, uh, not just as, as suicide bombers, as we also seen lately, but also taking up certain roles within the organizations. Um, now, in, in terms of, uh, say, policy response, that may be one area which, which um, uh, hasn't been sufficiently covered uh, uh, yet. Uh, again, we need more information, we need more studies, we need more data. Uh, and here, too, civil society can play uh, a, a, very, a, a very important uh, uh, role, also to help us then uh, to uh, develop the, the necessary uh, adequate programs to tackle that particular uh, issue. Uh, we know that civil society organizations uh, in the region have a long history of working on, on, on some of these issues uh, and are well placed uh, to, to actually uh, uh, help us uh, in, that, in, that, in that respect. Um, now, maybe uh, um, a, a last word. Um, uh, uh, on uh, all of this uh, at, after I just uh, mentioned some of our priorities. Um, that is that uh, what we need uh, above all is more coordination. Uh, and it's, and it's, uh, it's easily said, it's more difficult to actually uh, uh, do. Uh, there, but there's a lot of initiatives ongoing by governments, local authorities, um, donors, uh, um, that, that a real diversity of, of organizations. Uh, but coordination is, is absolutely key, and I can't uh, emphasize this enough. Uh, and let me just welcome, in this respect, the, the adoption uh, end of last year of the Bali uh, work plan. Um, a very good initiative, and, and we look forward to, uh, to engage uh, more in that, uh, in, in that process, which, which, is, which is definitely welcome. And I, maybe another uh, topical uh, element I would just add, that is that um, uh, together with Indonesia, the EU has uh, uh, prepared a joint statement in the context of the ASEAN Regional Forum uh, for adoption at the ministerial uh, tomorrow on uh, children, youth and, and, and violent uh, extremism, again, uh, uh, related to some of the issues I have been uh, speaking uh, about. So um, uh, that's, that's also part of that uh, 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 coordination, uh, so to speak. So. Uh, I think, uh, Ambassador, I will just uh, uh, stop here uh, and uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, for your comprehensive and informative uh, uh, presentation, uh, especially uh, 
relating to the priority that the European Union is giving to the uh, efforts in countering or preventing and countering uh, violent extremism and terrorism. I mean, you, you have mentioned the uh, 2005 EU strategy and what is uh, involved there. And also what is important is that you have uh, identified uh, some of the uh, cooperation that you are uh, having with, uh, with ASEAN. Uh, also good is to, to know from you the three priorities that, uh, for the future, which uh, among others are dealing with how uh, civil society could be uh, in power and, and, and be uh, involved with this matter. So uh, now I would like uh, to give the floor to the second speaker, uh, who is uh, my good friend, Mr. Andika Krishna Yudanto, Deputy of International Cooperation at the National Counterterrorism Agency of Indonesia. And prior to his current position, he had the work in dealing with transnational organized crime and its enforcement cooperation, including in his position as the director for regional and multilateral cooperation at the agency. So, uh, Andika, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Reslan Isarjani, uh, for the introduction. I would also like to thank you, Ambassador. Uh, for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, during the uh, pro, uh, the contemporary challenges in countering radicalization and violent extremism hosted by the ASEAN IPR, uh, something that we uh, have a close attachment to. Again, uh, I would say, for example, the uh, ASEAN plan of action on uh, countering the rise of radicalization and violent extremism does have a specific action line that uh, requires the promotion of ASEAN IPR uh, in our, our common effort in countering radicalization as well as violent extremism. Uh, I would also like to convey our appreciation to the ambassador of uh, EU uh, for his remarks. Uh, certainly we place a very strong emphasis on cooperation uh, and cooperating with the uh, European Union in particular, for example, Indonesia has great importance and strategic importance to how we are working within the PROTECT project, which is uh, focused on uh, countering violent extremism. Uh, again, Indonesia is also working with the uh, EU in respect to having an RF statement that requires us to uh, strengthen our common effort in uh, mitigating uh, children that are associated with uh, uh, terrorist groups. Again, this is something that I believe uh, warrants strong cooperation between ASEAN itself, as well as Indonesia with the EU. Now, uh, with regard to uh, the topic at hand, uh, allow me just to share with you the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, now, The, as what the ambassador of the U.S. mentioned, uh, again, is very uh, right, has rightly mentioned that uh, the U.N. plan of action to prevent violent extremism is what constitutes our effort in looking at the contemporary issues that are related to violent extremism. I think the importance of this particular uh, uh, plan of action had requested through a UNGA resolution uh, A-70-674 in 2016 that requested member states as well as regional organizations to come up with a plan of action in preventing uh, uh, violent extremism. And it is the importance of this particular uh, plan of action that wants to address what are the drivers of violent extremism. And there are two things. Uh, that are uh, that needs to be addressed. One is that the conditions conducive to and structural context of violent extremism, as well as the process of, of radicalization. Again, when we're looking at the conduce, conditions conducive and structural context, we have that uh, built in into the uh, UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy, which looks into the root causes of terrorism, for example, lack of socioeconomic opportunities, marginalization, 
uh, there's a poor governance, violation of human rights and rule of law, unresolved conflicts, as well as uh, contemporary problems right now that we are facing, not only in EU, also in Indonesia, such as radicalization in prisons. Uh, we're also facing uh, the what are the process of radicalization. So this is the push and pull factor where uh, what motivates an individual to join a violent extremist group, what are the collective grievances as well as victimization, and also uh, the distortion and misuse of beliefs, political ideologies, ethnic and cultural differences, as well as leadership and social networks that helps facilitate as, as the push factors for individuals to uh, becoming violent extremists. Now, the UN has set out seven priority areas, and I can mention as well that these seven priority areas are also the seven priority areas for ASEAN. And it looks at uh, how, uh, how that plan of action would provide a, a means for dialogue and conflict prevention. And then when we're talking about dialogue and conflict prevention, this aligns itself with what is being done through the ASEAN IPR. Also strengthening good governance, human rights, and the rule of law, the need to engage with communities, empowering youth, uh, the need for gender equality, empowering women, education, skills development, employment facility, uh, and also strategic communication, including through the internet and social media, where you would actually uh, provide counter narratives uh, in conjunction to uh, uh, any sort of uh, terrorist propaganda as well as violent extremists. Now, uh, these seven action priorities areas are something that is not usually heard of uh, before because much of the counterterrorism efforts has been focused on the hard approach, whereas this uh, prevention of violent extremism is coming in with a soft approach. So again, uh, uh, that becomes an important part of our effort in uh, combating violent extremism, leading to terrorism. Now, the ASEAN outlook has the same thing, the Manila de uh, Declaration uh, to counter the rise of radicalization and violent extremism, which was adopted in 2017, had the same main features as the UN uh, uh, POA on preventing violent extremism. It was to promote dialogue and conflict prevention, uh, good governance, uh, engaging communities, uh, all the seven principles that are there within uh, the UN plan of action. And one of the main features of that was to task uh, an expert uh, working group uh, under the senior officials meeting on transnational crime to formulate and develop an ASEAN plan of action to prevent and counter the rise of radicalization and violent extremism. Now, uh, this was adopted in uh, at the 12th ASEAN Minister Meeting on Transnational Crime in 2018 uh, of the adoption of the ASEAN Plan of Action to prevent and counter the rise of radicalization and violent extremism. Uh, and its objective was, uh, uh, was fourfold, actually. One, it strengthened close cooperation and how to cooperate better and collaborate among ASEAN member states uh, in means of uh, uh, preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, it also uh, focused on how ASEAN member states can build their capacity, in particular the law enforcement, in, uh, in countering violent extremism. It also uh, requested the need for ASEAN member states to better coordinate and collaborate in information sharing and intelligence. And also one of the, I think most of, one of the most important one is that how to enhance collaboration between various ASEAN sectoral bodies, uh, including uh, through a multi-pillar approach that does not only focus on the political and security, but also looks into the uh, ASEAN economic and social cultural community. And it also requested us uh, through this ASEAN plan of action to also focus how to strengthen cooperation with the dialogue partners, including international organizations, as well as relevant sub-regional uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, another one uh, of that ASEAN plan of action was a request that if member states of ASEAN is to come up with a national action plan, that they would use this ASEAN plan of action uh, as part of a consideration for, for building a national one. So again, uh, it would work 
to the advantage of the ASEAN member states to set up a national action plan that is based on an ASEAN action plan. Uh, the ASEAN plan of action focused on four pillars. Uh, the first pillar being the prevention of radicalization and violent extremism. Uh, the second pillar focused on counter radicalization and promotion of de-radicalization. Uh, the third pillar focuses on law enforcement, including strengthening national legislation related to countering uh, radicalization. And uh, the fourth pillar, which is strengthening partnership and regional cooperation. And when we talk about partnership, it does not focus on a G2G approach, but it also focuses on various civil society organizations that is working in the field of uh, uh, count, uh, preventing and countering uh, violent extremism. Now, uh, after uh, a year after that, uh, we had composed, uh, bearing in mind that if you want to uh, implement the ASEAN plan of action, there's certainly a need to better coordinate between the three pillars, between the political security, economic and the social cultural community and thereby uh, uh, this is uh, this particular Bali work plan synergizes within various cross sector and cross pillar uh, collaboration in preventing and countering and combating uh, 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 and countering violent extremism and within this Bali work plan there was a show of support for each sector of bodies to become uh, uh, the uh, uh, the implementer of the ASEAN plan of action, and those are there are 19 ASEAN sectoral bodies involved in that. Uh, most of the bodies are coming from uh, sectoral bodies that is within the political and security, and also from the social cultural community. So uh, this is the second time that I think ASEAN has been collaborating through a cross sectoral, cross pillar approach. Uh, uh, between various uh, sectoral bodies that cross, cut across uh, pillars. Now, uh, the same as the UN, uh, UN one, uh, Bali work plan focuses on those uh, seven pillars of the UN, which we believe are there are being empowered through our sectoral bodies uh, from the sec uh, social cultural pillar. Uh, for example, uh, empowering youth, you would have the senior officials meeting on youth to engage and in coming up with uh, programs and projects related to how to empower youth in, uh, in uh, preventing uh, the rise of radicalization and violent extremism as, 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 as an example. Uh, and, and if you're looking at it, the contemporary issues, if you're looking at the special ASEAN summit, on the coronavirus, which was uh, COVID-19, uh, that was adopted on the 14th of April. Uh, one of it is is a, a need for uh, the ASEAN to have more on strengthening their means of clarification of information, including uh, the, uh, to reduce stigmatization as well as discrimination. I think this comes in uh, to a point where uh, one of the biggest problems during this COVID uh, situation is there are a lot of propaganda out there uh, that is uh, contravening to what the government is working on. Now, uh, for example, through a global outlook, one thing when we're looking at how this relates to what is ASEAN's effort in, uh, in, in preventing and countering violent extremism, as well as the rise of radicalization, uh, there came up during the COVID-19, which we are now facing, uh, the UN Counterterrorism Executive Director came out with a report. Uh, there is two things that the report looks into. First, the short-term risk, and the second is the long-term risk uh, on what is the impact of the pandemic towards our effort in countering terrorism as well as in countering violent extremism. This report came out in June 2020. Uh, one, on the short-term risk, there is a captive audience. For example, right now, we're very much cap, uh, being captivated by focusing our work utilizing, uh, for example, Zoom. Uh, and right now, many people are working through uh, a means of communicating through uh, the internet. 
And in that sense, this provided those uh, radical groups or these, those violent extremist groups to furthering their narratives, their propaganda. So there is that certain rise of the use of, uh, of, of uh, narratives as well as terrorist narrative, including violent extremist narratives uh, to furthering their gains of, uh, of, of recruitment of individuals as well as groups. And also uh, there is a sense during this COVID uh, situation that some of the elements of the groups would be utilizing as it as alternative service providers where they might be abusing the humanitarian assistance. In the long term, uh, the UNC has seen that the, the pandemic may have a pre, uh, may create pressures. And one of them is that the pressure on the state's city resources, uh, the state's effort in countering terrorism uh, would be put into effort, uh, would be put into pressure because of uh, the focus of many governments on the health resources uh, reserved for actually combating the pandemic. Then also because of the reduced resources in the city effort, there might also be a possibility that the resources for non-state actors, in particular civil society organizations, would also be reduced in their effort to uh, prevent violent extremism as well as, the, as well as the rise of radicalization. Now, another part that uh, that the COVID, uh, the pandemic can create, is that it actually creates more grievances and acts as an as a driver uh, for violent extremism. So this is at the long term risk. This is something that may happen because of the pandemic, and then we are not faced with the fact that there is a decrease in uh, the rise of radicalization as well as violent extremism, but there might be a rise in uh, in the long term rise of violent extremism. This, I think the ambassador of, uh, of EU have also mentioned that we are not seeing a decrease, but we are also seeing an increase uh, of, of violent extremism, uh, not just in the EU, and we are also seeing that in Southeast Asia. Now, uh, this has been highlighted to uh, the Secretary General of the UN keynote speech during the virtual city week at the end of June uh, 2020, where uh, where he emphasized the need for states to keep up the momentum and invest in capabilities with regard to preventing violent extremism as well as CT efforts. Uh, monitoring the trains, trends that are coming up, we, we've, we've, had, uh, we've monitored trends that there is, for example, a uh, captive audience uh, because people are utilizing more of the internet and it's being used to further uh, uh, provide uh, uh, terrorist propaganda and also there's abuse of, uh, of service providers by uh, radical groups including violent extremist groups. Uh, again, there is a need to ensure that those actions need to take into account gender sensitivity. Uh, also, there is always a need to protect human rights and respect civic space. Uh, and also, one of the main important elements that I have mentioned before, that there is a need to tackle the negative narratives that is coming out there because of, 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 of the use uh, of internet. Uh, and then the fissures of emerging through the pandemic. And I think one of them that came up about uh, with this focus, uh, what is mentioned by the Secretary General is that there is also a rise of, uh, of white extremist uh, 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 white extremist, uh, extremism uh, during the pandemic as well, which also, for example, in Indonesia, we're also facing that sort of problem as well. Uh, now, uh, and one of the focus area uh, based on what the Secretary General has mentioned is that there is a need for member states to start strengthening information sharing uh, with regard to how best to uh, provide means uh, of looking into the impact of COVID-19 and with the uh, overall effort of member states in countering terrorism as well as countering violent extremism. Now, uh, this is how, when we're looking into this Indonesia, this, is, this would set out an example. Uh, when we're looking at the statistics, for example, uh, law enforcement in 2019, we, we based on our current law that we adopted uh, the revised law in 2018, 
we have apprehended more than 300 individuals. Uh, most of them that have been apprehended in 2019 was for uh, the preparatory acts of terrorism. Now we're looking into, for example, the uh, data of apprehensions uh, by July 2020. Already we've apprehended more than 100 individuals for uh, preparatory acts of terrorism. If, when we're looking at the statistic before COVID 2019 and after and during COVID in 2020, the numbers are the same. We believe that this is a case that uh, during COVID uh, for Indonesia, uh, the statistics, statistics remain the same for Indonesia as well, uh, that the elements of people preparing for acts of terrorism remains the same. It has not diminished the fact uh, that during the COVID, uh, there would be lower, there is lower expectation, but again, uh, the expectation is the same. And that is why the question is, why is terrorism still active during the pandemic in Indonesia? One, the COVID-19, it provides that fundamental tool for terrorist organizations to use it as a propaganda because of the captive audience. Uh, having those people locked at home and indoors and staying online provide that window opportunities for extremists to recruit, including by inciting terrorist acts. And uh, there is cases, and we believe, for example, uh, there have been cases where uh, our financial intelligence unit actually found out that uh, during the COVID situation, uh, there is a rise of 110 uh, percent of uh, of uh, uh, terrorist organizations abusing humanitarian assistance funds for COVID. So again. Uh, these are information that we are receiving and again uh, that problem uh, we reinstate as part of the contemporary issues of COVID and uh, on our effort to uh, combat CT. Now uh, for us as in conclusion the threats of terrorism and violence remain real uh, during the pandemic. Uh, what we cannot stress the importance of stressing out the need for prevention uh, as far as what is enshrined in our laws on countering terrorism. It is a statutory mandate of a state responsibility to, uh, to provide prevention programs and thereby any resources provided to CT still needs to be upheld and it should remain important. Uh, the prevention program there is always the need to involve the civil society organization, a whole of government and a whole of society approach is eminent. And also uh, for Indonesia, uh, strengthening international cooperation is a, a prerequisite and that Indonesia stands ready uh, to work and to support countries in the areas of preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, thereby, that ends my presentation for today, and would like to thank you again. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pa Andika, for uh, informing us of the latest collective uh, efforts in countering uh, violent extremism uh, and radicalization. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that you have uh, touched on the uh, short-term as well as long-term uh, effect or risk uh, uh, in, the, in, in the time of pandemic uh, with regard to the efforts in uh, PCVE. And what is good is also that uh, we have heard from you now that ASEAN has a plan uh, on PCRVE and that uh, it requires uh, every ASEAN uh, or requires or uh, hope that every ASEAN member state could have a national plan of action to, to implement it. So uh, now uh, I would like uh, to give the floor to our discussion for her commentary on, on the issue. This is uh, Dr. Emma Leslie, as most of you know, is currently the executive director of, uh, of partner institution in convening this webinar the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. She has dedicated her lifelong career to the field of conflict transformation, undertaking a range of initiatives, uh, 
uh, including community-based peace building and civil society engagement for peace. Emma, you have the floor. Thank you, Ambassador Reslin, and thanks to the speakers for today. I just, I just want to take uh, just a couple of minutes to draw out four things that have been talked about today, particularly as both IPA and the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies is a model of government to CSO engagement. But also I have the privilege of seeing who's in the room today and I can see that um, this conversation is happening both between a number of civil society leaders as well as, as government representatives. Um, there are four things that I really want to pull out. One is um, something uh, that Ambassador Igor uh, highlighted, which was the importance of us starting to share analysis um, from what might be more government or security circles um, alongside civil society, think tank and research institutes. And I think that we've done well in the last 20 years to bring these closer together, but I'm not sure we found a more robust bridge which helps us to draw those, those uh, sources of analysis together. And so I'd really like to see us be able to do that more in the next decade. I think the, the second thing is even the term terrorism. And I think in this context, we've probably alluded much more to the kind of terrorist networks that, that bridge out across state boundaries. I think there's a danger that we've started to use terrorism in more domestic situations as well which actually makes those efforts for dialogue and conflict prevention more difficult. Um, so any group that's labeled as terrorist or spoiler um, changes the dynamic of a conflict and makes the possibility to reach out to conflict stakeholders much more difficult and diminishes those possibilities, which, which um, Andika highlighted as action points for dialogue and conflict prevention. So I think we need to think more carefully about how we use the term. I think the third thing I want to draw out is definitely around language. I think uh, many of us um, now have become very savvy at saying preventing violent extremism, but I think we need to dig deeper into root causes and equally to think about when we say narratives and recruitment and so on. I think very often communities, young people in particular, are susceptible or vulnerable to recruitment precisely because they're living in a situation of exclusion or being marginalized um, or, or being very vulnerable, in fact, to that kind of um, effort to, to bring them in. So we say that we need to target social media. We say we need to target young people. We say we need to talk about radicalization in prisons, but it's precisely because of the condition of communities and people that they easily are recruited or that's me to my fourth point, which is really that I think it's time we started talking about this in the broader conflict transformation perspective. And I think that's really critical for us in ASEAN is that there are many communities, ethnic, religious, who do feel marginalized, excluded, on the outer, vulnerable, insecure which very often don't have channels um, to express their frustrations or their exclusion. And so addressing human rights and governance is a part of that, but significant conflict, trans a conflict transformation through constitution change, through policy change, through being able to um, appreciate diversity, to understand that minorities are as critical as majorities, well, I think significantly shift us into the next 10 years of what we need to do in order to reduce the kind of violence that comes from terrorism. So I really want to say thank you um, both to IPA and Ambassador Reslin for creating this space for us to hear this conversation today, but also for us to really mark this moment. It's, it's almost 20 years since 9-11. Um, we've invested a lot in trying to work out how do we prevent that kind of violence happening I think now we're almost on the cusp of a more mature and sophisticated approach and that civil society itself, um, think tanks and research institutes are ready to really dig deeper into how we go about reducing violence and, and transforming conflict, particularly in our region. Thank you, Ambassador Reslin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, as usual, very, uh, 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 very, um, how do I say that, uh, right to the point on, on uh, uh, identifying the issues important for us to, to, 
the focus. Well, we have entered now the last part of our uh, webinar, that is the Q&A, uh, and we have around 30 to 40 minutes uh, with us. And uh, I have uh, perhaps uh, to divide it into two parts of question and answer uh, with uh, two questions per session. Uh, now, the first question is, uh, uh, what is the take of, this, of uh, uh, the speakers on the vulnerability of youths towards uh, uh, violent extremism during the pandemic? And related to this uh, uh, question is, of course, uh, does the EU and ASEAN have a specific program in integrating uh, PCVE as curriculum in their uh, education. Uh, the second question relates to engagement with CSO. How, how, uh, how do you make uh, this uh, engagement effective? Uh, and what are the challenges in front of, of, of this? So uh, perhaps uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Drisman would like to uh, be the first to answer those questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very, very important questions indeed. In terms of the vulnerability of, of youth, I think uh, uh, Pa Andika has, has elaborated uh, on that uh, already, and, and I would fully subscribe to, to what he had to say. Um, if there is one thing that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, it is exposing the vulnerability of our uh, uh, young people uh, and um, maybe COVID indeed didn't have much of an impact uh, on uh, a terrorist activity, but clearly it was a period uh, for, um, uh, say, enhanced uh, recruitment uh, online. Um, uh, also, our youngsters, sometimes they feel uh, anxious, they feel the stress of the pandemic, and they are locked up in their rooms uh, from... Uh, the morning uh, till the evening, uh, watching their watching their screens. So, it, it is definitely fertile fertile ground for um, for terrorist uh, recruitment, and I, and I fear that's that's exactly what uh, what we've seen. In terms of <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of um, uh, programs that kind of link uh, education and uh, PCVE, uh, I don't think that we have a, a a project or program uh, exactly uh, like that, uh, but we do uh, have, uh, say, uh, programs that would uh, target youth specifically. Um, uh, I think about the uh, Strife uh, Juvenile uh, uh, Program, uh, which strengthens uh, uh, human rights and treatments of, of boys and girls, um, and also in our partnership with uh, UNDP, we'll try to use uh, some young uh, influential um, uh, video makers also through uh, uh, through uh, YouTube uh, and the like to target exactly that 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 type of uh, that type of audience. Um, when it comes to uh, engagement with uh, uh, civil society, well, there's there's many different uh, dimensions uh, to that. Uh, say from the project level, the, the the program level to a more kind of uh, uh, policy uh, uh, type of type of discussion. So, uh, from where we're sitting, we're, we're, we definitely encourage uh, more of it at, at all the different uh, levels. I think uh, I tried to explain also in my presentation where uh, we need civil society when it comes to uh, both providing us with the necessary data and research from uh, from the field, but also helping us. In, in, a, in a more correct design of, of, of projects. Um, and, and maybe last uh, last point on that, I for one also think that uh, it would be important to encourage also more engagement between civil society in ASEAN and civil society in the European Union. Uh, I think there is a number of programs already uh, which um, uh, civil society, where there is a civil society dialogue with, with other partners around the world uh, and, I, and I hope in the next couple of months uh, or, or, or 
uh, or more to, to establish a more structured dialogue between uh, ASEAN and, and European uh, civil society also on this particular issue of peace building uh, and, 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 and the very issue we've been talking about uh, today. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, looking into that, I think, yes, uh, even in ASEAN, uh, if you're looking at the Bali work plan, uh, the SOMI, or we, the, it's a shorter version for the senior officials meeting on, on youth, is actually in charge of providing uh, a means for uh, of establishing programs and projects that relates to how youth can better prevent, including counter uh, the rise of radicalization and violent extremism. Uh, also, in uh, bearing that in mind, uh, the senior officials meeting on education is also responsible as part of as as one of the uh, sector of bodies that is responsible. Uh, for making sure that within ASEAN countries there is a need uh, to have uh, a, a curriculum of how to counter uh, violent extremism as well as to keep an eye on, for example, the rise of radicalization. Now, uh, another important element that I see is that how do you get the civil society organization involved? And I think this was this is something that ASEAN has with, has been grappling with for a, num a couple of years now, is how to get uh, the civil society more involved into the contemporary uh, issues that is within ASEAN itself. Now, one of them that we have in the Bali work plan was actually to set up a platform for practitioners, and that practitioners would also include uh, civil society organization as part of that network to build that sort of a network in how we can uh, discuss per, uh, further uh, based on thematic issues of uh, uh, countering and preventing violent extremism. And uh, one of a network that we have already there, but it's not yet an ASEAN one, is called the Southeast Asian Network uh, on Countering Violent Extremism. So it is SEA Network is the abbreviation for that. Uh, this particular SEA network is in co collaboration with the uh, with Australia, uh, uh, and then uh, and it encompasses uh, several practitioners, including civil society organizations that are working uh, in Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, it's still within uh, four countries, which is Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand. So, we want to expand that to include all the 10 ASEAN member states uh, together with Australia, for example, and also to correlate that with working with the EU. So EU has this, uh, I believe the RUN network or the radicalization uh, uh, network that we want to work with. Uh, this, this proposal is actually, we're still working on a project proposal for this. Uh, again, we're going to show this with, violent, uh, with, with our dialogue partners uh, and hopefully, uh, 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 sometimes maybe this year or next year, uh, we can start establishing this network. And this particular network would, in a way, uh, provide that platform uh, to strengthen uh, how civil society organizations can be engaged in uh, areas where uh, ASEAN is uh, working on, for example, on CVE. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, there, uh, there is a question that uh, I think relates to what Andika said about uh, a platform for, for consultation between the government and CSO. And uh, the question relates to <clears throat> the, the issue of how you empower women as component, uh, as an important component or in the, in the efforts to counter uh, violent extremism. And um, uh, the question also is looking whether there is any program uh, to provide the, such platforms of women talking to women. And the other thing is that uh, are there efforts undertaken uh, to ensure uh, women participation in, uh, in uh, 
at, at the regional level as well. <clears throat> and uh, the other one uh, is about uh, the efforts to create a resilient, a resilient community uh, uh, that that can withstand all this. Uh, uh, what what you have mentioned in the uh, in the sphere of uh, 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 internet, where uh, narratives uh, are uh, really uh, uh, provided. I mean, narrative. Uh, uh, a narrative encountered uh, by, by the by uh, the terrorist group and and, <clears throat> and narrative that, that uh, should be uh, given also by encountering in uh, encountering it uh, and in this case uh, the uh, uh, one of the component of the resilient community is the family family as a, as a basis uh, uh, to uh, withstand all this. Uh, uh, narratives uh, uh, coming out uh, from terrorist group. So, uh, what is your take on that? Maybe I start with Pa Andika first, and then uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Drisma. Pa Andika, please. Right. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I think certainly when it comes to uh, women and how they can women can talk directly with women and how that platform provides that opportunity i think one of it is that uh when we're thinking about a platform we're th uh, talking about a network on a cve for the region a regional network uh part of that part of the theme uh, or the uh, group theme is actually on women and how we can uh, empower women how we fit in the issue of women into all the issues of PCV. And I think this is where actually uh, we can gain uh, more prominence uh, related to the issue of women into that, uh, into the work of CVE. So this platform will actually, one of the thematic uh, goal is to find, to have one that is related to uh, women. Uh, again, this is one of uh, the topic that we wanted to have as part of the theme. And another one, if you're looking into uh, 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 how uh, public online we provide promote intercommunal conversation, uh, yes, there is a problem. I think there, you know, the the COVID situation has made us more adaptable to working through the internet. And, and all the information that we are getting it right now is every one of them is through uh, the internet. And again, this is where we actually need to uh, focus on and how we can provide that counter narrative. But how do we also, and I think one of the main elements there is how we can showcase uh, that there is a strong public private partnership when it comes to internet governance uh, where uh, one, I think one that is being worked on by the OECD is called the so-called uh, uh, Voluntary Transparency Reporting Protocol, where, you know, where it is not the, it's not an obligation, but it's voluntary, where the internet service providers uh, would be the ones uh, taking down if there are contents that are quite, uh, that is violent, uh, that is a violent extremist content, where they would have this voluntary nature to provide those uh, means of taking down uh, messages that are uh, that would not benefit the public per se. Now, this is something that we need to think about, uh, and one of them is uh, certainly strengthening public-private partnership because certainly the government cannot work alone, and it needs to work with uh, uh, with the private sector. Uh, in providing that uh, uh, understanding within uh, the internet. Now, uh, there's another question that looks into peaceful dealing instead of countering terrorism. Uh, again, uh, most of the words that we are using right now uh, is focused not only on countering, but we're also focusing on the words prevention. And again, when you're relating to prevention, then I think it's related to uh, the softer side of, uh, of, of countering terrorism. Uh, thank you, Ambassador.
That's the word, Grisman. Uh, you have the floor. Well, th thank you very much. I, I, um, I, I like to speak after Pa Andik so that I can uh, agree with everything that uh, he, he has said. Um, <laughs> uh, it's exactly what I'll do just now. Uh, um, um, so maybe, maybe just one word. It, it really is, um, um, say, an overall societal conversation uh, uh, to be had. Uh, about uh, about the role of women, about norms uh, and values that will create that uh, uh, that societal resilience, and then you can have operational tools to improve technological uh, literacy, or or to have more maybe more gender sensitive uh, media. But uh, ultimately, you want a, a, a broader uh, uh, societal uh, conversation and. Uh, that's 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 needed in in, in many countries uh, 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 around uh, uh, the world. But uh, I think I'd leave it at that. Well, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Emma, do you like to uh, comment on on those uh, questions that have been put to the two speakers? Well, yes, because you're in danger of having three men talk about women's empowerment and women talking to each other. So I better weigh in here to protect you all, haven't I? <laughs> I, think, um, I think that, I mean, I think part of what we're talking about here is a trust deficit between some of these sectors, because I think, I mean, we're talking about civil society and government being able to work together around a highly contentious um challenging space and so precisely um, a conversation between women who have been victims of violence who who now want to express themselves through violence um, I think these are these are sensitivities and 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 really how we really build trust between us um, will be fundamental to how we go forward and so what we really need to be talking about is serious partnerships um, where we can feel safe, where we can share information, where we can be more open about what the reality is, and and therefore um, and therefore be able to address this this terrible violence that's in our midst. So I think um, women to women conversations are already going on. I think there are vast networks and and women leaders who are already active on those things. I think it's how we bring these two conversations together. But equally, how do we how do we make Groups like civil society who are who are not um, always feeling legal, safe in political spaces, and so on and so forth, be able to come into a space where they're guaranteed that they can be open and and share information more readily. So, so I think yeah, we have a lot of work to do, and I think this conversation is very helpful in that in raising some of these concerns. Thank you, Emma. Uh, we have another five to, to ten minutes, and uh, <clears throat> there is there is uh, somebody who who agrees uh, with what uh, Emma uh, uh, have, have said. Uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, we need to be careful about labeling or using the language terrorism as this may affect dialogue initiatives and conflict resolution. Um, and she would like to ask, uh, propose this question to Anika, uh, that since it has been 20 years uh, after 9-11, uh, whether there has been really a comprehensive assessment made on what the international community uh, or national governments uh, should, should should uh, how do I say that uh, 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 should improve uh, because uh, after uh, after reviewing what what has not uh, been achieved and what has been achieved so that is the question for Andika. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, th that's a very very good question. Uh, again, I think Ambassador, as we both have shared our experience in the, in New York as well. Uh, what we are seeing is that even up till now, since, uh, you know, 20 years ago, till now, 
the UN has not even shaped up a comprehensive convention on uh, international terrorism. Uh, one specific matter was that there was no agreement on the definition of terrorism. And I think the part is that it's it's hard to come up with a, 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 def, a definition uh, uh, for terrorism because simply uh, it was hard for countries uh, to look into what is the motivation of terrorism itself. Now, again, I think this is why in 2016, there was a general assembly resolution that pinpointed for countries, there is a need for countries to come up with national action plans. Uh, they even requested uh, that uh, regional uh, uh, bodies also start making a plan of actions. And that was focusing on preventing violent extremism. So uh, when we're looking at that, there is almost a shift. To some governments, they, it's, it's a synonym between terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, some see it uh, a line before, just before a terrorism act starts to transpire. Uh, I see it, uh, it could be used interchangeable. Uh, that's my own personal view of uh, terrorism and violent extremism. But again, even so, when we're looking at the General Assembly resolution, it was the prerogative of member states to, uh, uh, to come up with a uh, definition on what uh, violent extremism. For example, Indonesia is also coming up with a national action plan on preventing and countering violent extremism. Uh, we now, I can fairly say that we have agreed uh, to come up with a defini definition of what violent extremism is. Uh, it took us almost three years just to come up with a definition for that. So again, uh, uh, definition has, what has been one of the problems, but if you're looking at what the plan of action of the, you know, this U.S. Secretary's General Plan of Action was actually to address uh, conflict situation. And again, uh, means for preventing uh, conflict is also means for preventing violent extremism. So again, I think uh, those two uh, correlate between each other. Uh, so that would probably be my answer. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, there is one more question that uh, is now arriving at my desk, and uh, this is related to uh, the uh, question of youth. Uh, you know that uh, the uh, UN is now is having a, a year of of, of, the, of youth it's related to uh, the. Uh, security and political uh, uh, issues. And uh, the question is uh, simple, but uh, and addressed to both of you. Uh, how, how do you envisage the way in empowering the youth uh, participate, uh, so they could participate uh, meaningfully in the efforts to counter uh, uh, violent uh, radicalization and violent extremism? So, Ambassador, uh, you could we like to, to to answer that first? Thank you very much. Maybe maybe just uh, maybe the shortly um, uh, again. Um, uh, there's there is basically a, a two track approach that one needs. One is more more research, uh, more data uh, on on exactly how to uh, tackle with uh, tackle this uh, issue. How to involve youth uh, more uh, and better um, and secondly there is a, there is a need to develop maybe more targeted uh, more targeted uh, programs i think i spoke uh, earlier on about the uh, strife uh, juvenile program which is uh, which is one example of how to do this uh, by um, for example having uh, some um, uh, um, say uh, more influential uh, youngsters, um, uh, YouTube or Instagram or um, other social media stars to send more positive uh, messages uh, uh, to youth. Um, so that's that's there's a number uh, of, of ways, a number of programs that, uh, in that sense, uh, are definitely useful uh, to uh, to explore uh, further apart from. What I tried to say uh, earlier—that is, uh, you, one requires a broader, 
uh, a broader societal uh, debate. Um, maybe maybe one, um, one, one more general remark, because I saw coming in the uh, uh, chat box a question on um, the public, they say the fear that um, uh, COVID exac exacerbates uh, prejudice and, 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 and racism. Uh, also amongst uh, amongst uh, uh, youngsters, or at least that problem uh, exists, and, and how to to combat that. Um, well, I, for me, the answer uh, lies partly with um, with the leadership, leadership in our in our uh, uh, respective uh, countries, and when you see that uh, basically since the start of the pandemic, some world leaders have um, have started uh, labeling the uh, coronavirus a chinese uh, virus um, uh, that is uh, that is not helpful um, uh, my 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 current boss uh, said uh, uh, the chinese virus the chinese virus isn't chinese to the same extent that the spanish flu wasn't spanish and he he can know he's he's, he's spanish himself so um, it's about it's a it's a matter of discourse. It's a matter of of, of narrative, uh, and that's not just about China. But we experienced also in this part of the world, in Southeast Asia, uh, sometimes uh, statements by national leaders which were targeted at Europeans, uh, uh, which allegedly would bring in uh, uh, COVID nineteen. So. Obviously, if, 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 if youth, if youngsters uh, hear about these type of uh, statements, uh, that will definitely uh, exacerbate uh, uh, tension, prejudice, uh, and, uh, and racism. And then we can deploy all the nicest uh, programs uh, uh, and projects in the world that uh, will be of, 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 of little help. Um, anyway, uh, Pandika will, I'm sure, have more. Uh, th thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ambassador, uh, I think, yes, there are three things that uh, when we're talking about youth empowerment, how we should do it. One, I think the most foremost important is that we need to hear the voices of what the youth is saying. So this is something that is so most important. Uh, so their voice needs to be heard. Uh, second thing that we need to uh, 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 bear in mind when we want to focus on youth empowerment. Yes, certainly I do believe that more research needs to be done so we, we are provided with uh, evidence-based uh, policy making. But one of them is to actually uh, uh, involve the youth in, in effort for preventing uh, violent extremism. Uh, there is no deny that there is a need to uh, strengthen participation of youth in uh, programs that are related to preventing violent extremism. And the third, I think, and that is the most important element that when we as government uh, is coming up or making policies, then we need to involve the youth so that it would be uh, uh, policies that they are participating in making help uh, uh, government decide on what uh, policies to be made in regards to preventing violent extremism. So these are the three main elements that I believe would help empower youth. Uh, certainly, an important element of that is how there is also a, a need for us to conduct more studies relevant to how to empower youth uh, in preventing violent extremism. Thank you. I think uh, we have uh, come close to the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, but before I uh, uh, close the meet, uh, this webinar, I would like to give uh, to you uh, each uh, one minute uh, uh, to say to say something uh, uh, your take on what we have discussed so far. So perhaps I start with Ambassador uh, Drisman. One minute. Okay, I'll, I'll be even shorter uh, than that. But uh, mainly just to. Thank you for uh, organizing this uh, webinar uh, today. I think one can see from uh, the questions that we received uh, how this topic is, um, 
uh, is an important one that raises uh, all kinds of different angles to uh, to politics, to policies, to uh, uh, to society, and, and what we uh, as policymakers uh, can do, and what what civil society can do. Uh, so um, a big thank you. It just calls for. Uh, even more uh, of this kind of, of conversations uh, so that we can um, uh, basically adjust our policy and, and uh, develop, uh, develop in the future um, programs that are uh, even more uh, adequate. Um, also, uh, for us, uh, a call to, to double down on that partnership that we have uh, with ASEAN as a region, uh, as well as with uh, all of the uh, uh, Southeast Asian uh, 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 countries. This is a, a, a problem that is not uh, um, limited to, to any one country. It's a, it's a global one, as I mentioned at the beginning. We suffer from attacks, uh, and uh, so, so have you. So um, let's just uh, uh, continue the good work. And, and again, thank you very much. We got one minute. Oh. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador, I think. Uh, uh, what the, the ambassador of you has mentioned already that this is an important topic. Uh, we should keep this topic alive, uh, and we would like to thank ASEAN APR for coming with this uh, uh, virtual uh, webinar. Uh, something that we look into is also that we need to remain vigilant on our effort in uh, preventing and countering the rise of radicalization and violent extremism. Certainly, the COVID situation has not. Uh, 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 has also made it a challenge for us, uh, those working in the field of uh, preventing violent extremism. And again, we more needs to be done. I would, uh, I could say that there is a need to strengthen, empower women as well as empower youth in our effort in preventing violent extremism. And most of all, I think it's also important uh, to involve the civil society organization as our partner when we're undertaking this endeavor. Thank you very much, Ambassador. One minute for you, Emma. I want to say we'll prevent violent extremism and terrorism when we address grievances, that young people are the most attuned to those grievances. And so they're in the very core of this conversation. And many young leaders already, we've seen it in the last two years, Greta Thunberg, Joshua Wong, so many across our region are already leaders who are seeking to find nonviolent ways to bring about change and to address grievances. And I think um, we can talk about trying to get people away from terrorism, but I think we're going to have to give them tools and ways of expressing those grievances in nonviolent ways, unless we're going to address the very core of the structural violence, the systemic violence that they're opposed to. So, um, so address grievances, Young people are the core, absolutely, they already lead, and, and nonviolence would be one way for us to, to move away from, from violent and, and extreme responses to those frustrations. Thank you so much to IPA and Ambassador Reslin, as always. Thanks for your leadership in this area. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, I think after uh, the three one minutes uh, remarks, I don't need to I don't have anything to conclude. I mean, I better leave the uh, meeting with your uh, one minute remark. I think uh, that is uh, very uh, uh, thought provoking. Um, so the, the duty for me is to now to uh, thank uh, our distinguished speakers, our uh, discussion, and of course, uh, the participants for following this webinar enthusiastically and actively. And I think uh, this has been a very fruitful and indeed an enlightening uh, discussion. Uh, I would uh, then uh, wrap up this webinar, but I would uh, uh, with that uh, like to invite uh, all the participants uh, to give a round of applause in appreciation of our resource person and discussion. Uh, so uh, a huge round of applause for three of them. Uh, well, this uh, concludes the third part of the uh, ASEAN IPI discussion series. Uh, for those of you 
who may have missed this live uh, session, not to worry, uh, because uh, there is a recording of this webinar and then it will be available uh, shortly through our YouTube channel. And on behalf of the ASEAN IPR, I would like to thank our dear partner, CPCS, for a great collaboration. Looking forward for more collaboration in the future. Uh, our distinguished resource uh, person, such a privilege to have you with us and share your thoughts, views, insights, and experiences. And of course, to our participant for your support and your enthusiasm, as well as giving us your thoughts and insights through your uh, comments and questions on the issue. Um, we will have a fourth part of this, the discussion series in October. Therefore, uh, please stay tuned and follow us, or follow us or subscribe to our social media. We are available on, we are available on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Thanks again, everyone. This is Friday, so have a nice weekend. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mute, 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 please.